creative thinker out of the box. And I think one of the things that has really um, precipitated that is the ability that he has and the interest he has in getting um, more quantitative and also being um, so diving into the programming side. So he he's able to test ideas that has not been and he's not restricted by the software he's using, but he's able to actually go out, dive into it and figure out what it's on, uh, what is actually happening and create new um, visualization techniques, analysis techniques and, and different things. Um, one thing to highlight that is not uh, that is tangential to the geoscience side is that he actually has a really interesting um, geochronological time scale um, resume that he built <laughs> as well, where um, if you've got the time, uh, look that up. And um, uh, it's likely on his website. If not, I'm sure you can find it on social media. I've seen a few people share it recently. But uh, without uh, further ado, I'll actually get into his bio. Um, Matt actually has a PhD in sedimentology and, from the University of Manchester. And uh, <laughs> with a deliberately vague 20-something years experience in the energy industry. Uh, he's worked for a number of companies, uh, including um, Equinor, Landmark, and ConocoPhillips, uh, where he's also been a ge geophysical advisor. Um, he has a number of books, articles, and papers that he's uh, written as well. One of the ones that um, I keep in my bookcase is um, 52 Things Every Geophysicist uh, Should Know. Uh, hopefully, I've quoted that title correctly. It's close uh, enough. Close enough. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I read the articles, not the title. <laughs> it's a long title. Uh, yeah. But uh, I'm, I'm grateful that he's here to uh, give us this little intro on, on how to get more quantitative and kind of a, a more fun approach about um, how doing so is, is like choosing your own adventure. So I'll leave it to you, Matt, here to take it away and to um, begin your presentation. All right, thanks, Dennis. Uh, thanks a lot. Thanks everyone for uh, for pitching up to to listen to me for a little bit, and then hopefully have a bit of a discussion, um, chat, Q and A, whatever you like um, afterwards. Um, yeah, <laughs> I, you know, often reflected on uh, my career. I'm not one of those people that plans things, so I never really sat down. In fact. I think I stumbled really into uh, Statoil, my first job. Um, so I was mainly attracted to, to living abroad for a bit and, and wanted to spend some time in Norway. Um, and, you know, I was excited about working subsurface and, and so on as well. But I had all sorts of other irons in the fire. I even applied to like the civil service and an advertising company, if I remember rightly. So um, and then actually, while I was doing my PhD, I... I was, it was early days of the internet, right? So 1993, um, so it was right at the beginning, uh, just after I started. And I was offered a job in Singapore as a web developer, which of course, basically no one really knew how to develop websites. I'd written a little bit of uh, HTML and put it on the internet and someone in Singapore offered me a job there. And I often wonder like, what, what would have happened if I'd taken that? Um, but I went a bit more kind of uh, traditional old school uh, as a geologist and, and went into the oil and gas industry. And I'm not sorry I did. I've had, uh, had an awesome time so, of it so far. Now, um, yeah, so choose your own adventure. <laughs> the slides that I'm going to show you, um, just because there's a few links and things, I don't want you to have to kind of scribble things down and try to find them later. So I've, the... URL for these slides is in yellow there um, on the screen. So um, if you go there, you should get right onto the slides. If you don't, drop uh, something into the, I guess, the Q&A or the chat in here um, in Zoom, and um, I'll, I'll sort it out. But I think you should have no problem getting in there. Now, how do I progress my, OK, like that, no. I'm trying to move slides, but I can't for some reason. Okay, there we go. Th this is actually one of the questions I get very often on LinkedIn and Twitter and in the software underground um, and random emails and things is, uh, you know, people asking, well, they often ask, I want to do machine learning. What do I do? Where do I start? Um, in my mind, there's, there's sort of a few pieces to you know, doing machine learning. There's there's the quantitative maths, 
side of it and there's the programming side of it. Um, I, and there's all sorts of barriers in the way of both of those things, perhaps especially programming. It's not easy to get into programming. Neither of those things are uh, easy things to learn. A lot of people have had a bad experience of learning maths at school and university and sort of see equations and immediately switch off. And, um, and I think a lot of people have the same experience with learning to code. And, um, you know, one of the things I've tried to do over the last few years is remove those barriers for people or at least smooth them out a little bit. You can't remove all of them. Um, you know, maths and coding, it's, they're, they're not easy things to learn. Um, so, you know, I'd say it takes years really to get a level of comfort um, in that space. Uh, the cool thing is, it's never too late to start, you know. I think some people these days are sort of feel like, oh no, like I'm behind, you know, uh, the world's doing machine learning and I'm and I'm not, so I am I feel left out and I can't catch up. Um, that's not the case at all. There's so, there's like every single problem you look at um, through a machine learning sort of lens in earth science sort of opens out into this landscape of, um, interesting problems that that no really hardly anyone is working on so there's so much opportunity um i was saying to andrew just before we started it really it you know i think this is a bit like what it was like at the beginning of sort of 3d seismic um you know there's all these possibilities are opening out and we're only really just starting to explore them so now is a fantastic time to get more quantitative and and sort of explore this space um, and I'm not just talking about machine learning, like just essentially just exploring your data and, and getting in there and doing analysis, um, computing attributes, making uh, visualizations, wh wh whatever takes your fancy. I think all of those things are awesome ways to give yourself um, optionality, basically, in your career. Like th this is about, for me, it's a, more about building resilience and options in your career than it is about being able to say I can code in Python or whatever. Um, so yeah, these, these choose your own adventure books, uh, I, I guess were really popular on this side of the Atlantic um, in the sort of eighties. And uh, I, I grew up in the UK. So um, I grew up with a different bunch of books, these ones. Uh, I think they were called FF, Fighting Fantasy was the name of these ones. They, so they, it, was a, it was the same concept as Choose Your Own Adventure, um, but with a bit of a uh, Dungeons and Dragons kind of um, role-playing game mixed in. So you would meet people and roll dice. So there's a stochastic element to it where you, you know, there's some randomness introduced by the rolling of dice, uh, fighting people and so on. And you would have to choose, you know, do I open the casket or go through the door? Do I speak to the warlock or... Um, put on the magic cloak that sort of thing <laughs> and um uh, what i like about these is that they're sort of um in a way i think they're a great introduction to programming because they include conditionals basically a sort of if else type statements you know that's really what a decision is um some of them contain recursion and loops like a maze where you would end up back at the same place um so that you could make different set of choices. And then they've got sort of um, conditions upon which, you know, the, the story is over. Um, and some sort of exit condition of, you know, whether you died or not, basically, um, or survived or won the treasure or whatever. And actually some uh, people have, uh, like Brian McLaughlin here has um, made a comic book that's a choose your own adventure. So if you look carefully at the, um, uh, the, the boxes in the strip, you can see that they're sort of linked and some of them are separated where there are decisions to make and there are arrows all over the place where you can sort of go left or go down. Um, and I, I really like that kind of visual unpacking of the medium. And uh, there's a few other uh, artists have done the same kind of thing, um, packed to choose your own adventure into a comic. But what this is getting at, this sort of new visualization, if you like, of that, um, story uh, is that there's a um, there's a structure there, 
And actually some data scientists, uh, especially I think in the sort of mid 2000s, this seemed to be very popular on the internet, was to take these books. And this is a representation of one of the Choose Your Own Adventure books. Um, it's called a narrative map here. Um, and to uh, show the decision tree, basically. So this, this is that tree uh, for that book. And like I say, lots of people were making these visualizations in the sort of mid noughties or whatever we call that decade. And um, it wasn't just, you know, it was pe people for doing this for um, sort of analysis of literature, uh, but also computer scientists doing it as a way to talk about things like tree structures. Uh, many of these things are essentially binary trees where there are two decisions to make at each point. Uh, this one is not quite a binary tree because I see there are some nodes here that split into more than two. Um, but these are important structures in lots of algorithms, um, in things like search algor algorithms, for example, where if you can organize data into a tree, you can do searches of that data set much more efficiently uh, than you can if you're just sort of having to examine every every item, for example. Um, there are also applications in um, sort of through, let's say, 3D geometry, where we can organize points into a tree and very quickly find neighbors of a given point, which is something we often want to do in certain machine learning algorithms or in any sort of distance-based lookup, so a spatial, um, spatial search, for example. Now, the colors here uh, refer to what sort of ending you've got. So um, the green things in this one are return home. So presumably that's, uh, you know, a good ending. The red ones, I think you're dead. <laughs> so that's a bad ending. Uh, and then uh, yellow, new life. I don't actually know um, what that means because uh, I haven't read this book. Um, but anyway, the, the point is that once we've got this kind of structure, we can start to do analysis. And one or two people have taken this um, you know, uh, further. So uh, here's a, another book. Um, this one is for another one of the Choose Your Own Adventures, but Journey Under the Sea. And um, again, the color codings um, refer to the endings. So red for death, uh, yellow for neutral, blue, or this light blue color for favorable. And what the, this person was interested in was not so much how many endings are there um, out of the 42 endings. You can see that more than 20 of them result in uh, death or an unfavorable ending. But what uh, he was actually interested in was what are the, what's the probability, given a random choice at each one of these steps, um, of each outcome. And the probability of a bad outcome is, is very high, even though it's uh, only about half of the endings. So, you know, the, the, I guess the, the, the message here for me is, um, you know, by what at first was just a visualization, then turns out actually to be um, a data structure, which it turns out has a lot of maths behind it um, in the shape of graph theory. Um, graph theory is the sort of theoretic framework for these networks. And, uh, and that can lead to analysis and insight and uh, novel science uh, or, or uh, I guess, literature um, studies or whatever you call that field. So um, I, I really like going on that kind of journey, right? So starting with just some questions about something, qualitative questions, and ending up reading books about graph theory and computing eigenvalues for... Uh, <laughs> for um, uh, to, to compute relative importance of paths and things like that. So um, that's really what I, I wanted to talk to you about is like, how do you, essentially what you'd, I think what you want to do to become a quantitative person is to go down that path uh, as often as possible. Like you wanna take ideas and poke them and run with them and Google search them and play with them in code to get at the, the quantitative side of the idea, and that actually opens up uh, new doors. So what I thought we could do next, and this is a bit of an experiment because we've only done this once before um, now, and I'm not sure how it'll work with what are there. There are 15 of us all together. So let's see how this goes. But um, I'd like you to go please to this URL. So uh, it's careermap.org 
softwareunderground.org. It's on the screen there in sort of black and gray. Um, so go to that URL. Uh, when you go there, you should see this. And uh, what I'd like you to do here, if you don't mind, it's completely anonymous. So it's not going to capture any data about you. It's only going to capture the data that you give it. Uh, so it doesn't, it doesn't know where you are or anything like that. It just captures the time and uh, the data that you give it. Um, and what, what I'd like you to do is um, enter what your career so far sort of looks like. Now, I think um, most of the audience here are sort of early career professionals. Um, so, you know, I realize there might only be one or two things on there. That's completely fine. Um, uh, Dennis and Andrew and I can fill it in as well. Uh, actually, this is, this is my path here. So the way this works is the format here is, and it's not really a job exactly, it's more like where do you work? Um, but anyway, uh, I, so I had three years of undergrad, four years of postgrad, um, three years in a um, national oil company, four years in a software company, five years at an independent um, or integrated, I guess, actually integrated oil company, uh, and then 10 years in a service company, which is Agile, where I work now. Um, so that's, that's the format, separated by commas. So if you wouldn't mind entering your path, I'm just going to copy this one since it's me <laughs> already, uh, and I'm going to put it there. Uh, why can't I do that? I don't know. Let me try that again. Please don't make me type it. Oh, that's great. Okay, something fishy going on with my keyboard. Oh, I'm really sorry about my very squeaky chair. Um, it seems like my keyboard's not working, which is obviously going to spoil the rest of my day. Um, but okay, never mind. In fact, uh, maybe one of you, <laughs> Dennis, could yes. you put my data in, please? Sure. To put your own in, and can then I hit submit, I, and then go can, back home, and just copy and paste mine in because, for some reason, I can't type anything right now. Okay, so because yours is just the example. Mine is the example. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. In. Thank you. But now, how am I going to go to? This is really mysterious. Let me just try this again. Maybe it's just a faulty connection. I still can't type anything. And I didn't open a... So did you just mouse over to... Um, uh, say that again? So how, how do you switch the screens there? Was that just with your mouse? Yeah, I'm clicking on the screens, but I need to go to another page that I don't have a button for. And, uh, and I can't type, which is super, super mysterious. Um, oh, I wonder if it's, it's not something to do with Zoom. Okay, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come back to that. I'll try and fix that when we, when we get into the, the questions. Um, but what I'd like it to do, what it should do for me, is uh, draw a little map of, the, of everyone's careers, basically, and how they're sort of connected. Um, so I'm going to come back to that it's, cause I, because I can't type. Um, and, or, or maybe I'll think of something clever, a way around being able to type. <laughs> <laughs> speech to text or something. Uh, anyway, cool. Well, um, now it turns out that you can, uh, like with my non-existent career data, which we'll come back to, that you can actually draw uh, lots of things as a network. Um, there's an example network between four nodes here in the middle of the screen. Um, and sort of from networks, there's all sorts of directions you can go in. So if you've got something that you can model as a network, you can go look at things like uh, Neo4j, which is a, net, a special database for networks, NetworkX, which is a Python library for handling networks, uh, Cytoscape is a similar thing in JavaScript. There's some awesome books you can go and read, like this graph al algorithms book. Um, there's courses you can go and take. There's an awesome Coursera course on graph theory. 
And then there are even geological applications, uh, like for example, GemPy, which builds implicit 3D geological models uh, using graphs in the background. Um, that's how it's doing a computation. Uh, and then I don't know if you saw the force machine learning contest recently uh, that happened, I guess, last fall um, in Nor. Well, it was a global thing, but it was run by force in Norway. It's a consortium in Norway. Um, and they were using something called cost sensitive learning in uh, a lithology prediction task. And um, cost sensitive learning fundamentally depends on a graph um, being able to connect the lithologies you're trying to predict or whatever you're trying to predict um, in, a, in a graph. A graph is just a, a fancy name for one of these networks. Well, it's not very fancy, but the technical name, I guess. Um, now, this one that's in the middle is actually um, an analysis of a sedimentary sequence of rocks. Um, so I'm using the word sequence there, not in a sort of sequence strat sense, but in uh, just a you know, an, an array, an ordered array of rocks. Um, in fact, it's from this paper by Powers and Easterling. They were the f one of the uh, first people to talk about using Markov chains, um, which is a way of modeling a sequence. Uh, and they presented some data from a sedimentary sequence. Now these are transitions. So uh, what this is trying to say is I've got four lithologies, uh, let's say A, B, C, and D. Um, those are the rows and the columns. And in the first row here, I can see that there are no transitions from A to A. So let's say that's sandstone to sandstone. So that makes sense because um, at least the way that they were counting their data, they didn't count uh, like to like as a transition. Uh, and then there's 37 examples of A passing upwards into B, uh, three of A passing upwards into C, and two of A into D, uh, and so on. And uh, I reconstructed a sequence which fits this, um, this set of frequencies uh, here in the middle. So this is what such a sequence might look like. Obviously, there are an infinite number of random sequences. Or, well, I guess the point is that they're, they're not random, but um, of of sequences which would match this data. And then the question is, the question about that you want to ask about this piece of data, which is obviously pretty easy to collect, um, is are there preferences here in what comes after what, or is it random? Um, and now there's a test you can run to figure out if uh, it seems to be random or not. And what the test basically does is it says, okay, well, let's simulate um, a bunch of rocks in these proportions, but make them completely random. And then we'll have a completely random version of this transition matrix. And then let's compare the observed transitions to the random ones. And if there's a big deviation, if, there's, if the, um, the observed transitions are substantially different from the random ones, then there seems like there's some sort of preference there. And we end up with this matrix that I've colored in rather than give you the numbers. Uh, over on the right here. Uh, so what this says is, for example, C upwards into A is strongly preferred. In fact, it's four standard deviations away from um, randomness, if you like, uh, is strongly preferred in this sequence. So, so what does that mean? Well, it means that if you've got something like, uh, let's say you've got a uh, shallow marine section well, typically that's gonna go from like offshore mud into lower shore face, upper shore face, and then maybe you're gonna get, uh, let's say you get a coal. Um, so that upper shore face into coal is gonna be a really strong preference. You're, no, you're not gonna go uh, from offshore mud into coal. You're only gonna go from the upper shore face into coal. Uh, so that's the kind of relationship that's gonna emerge from this analysis. So this stuff's all in a library that I wrote called Striplog, it's a Python library. Um, but here we are, we're back at the, um, a, a network or a graph. And the, the network, by the way, is completely equivalent to this matrix. In fact, all matrices, square matrices, um, can be considered to express a graph uh, and vice versa. So there's lots of interesting maths you can do with matrices um, and lots of cool things you can do with graphs, like ask questions about paths. 
um, ask questions about clusters and things that like to be together uh, and so on. And uh, you know, we're back at that point where, okay, we've got a formal structure for something, now we can do lots of analysis. Um, okay, so, where, oh, so this, um, this crazy looking, uh, I can't even call it a diagram. I'm not even sure what this is. This piece of graffiti um, was what I had in my mind when I initially talked to Dennis about, about doing a, a talk like this. And I'm not going to claim victory or anything, but um, this was the product of my exploration of the question. How, like, where do I start with, um, with getting more quantitative? Like, I want to learn about machine learning. Where do I start? What do I need to know? Now, clearly, I haven't answered that question with this, whatever it is. Um, and I think in drawing it, I realized, well, it sort of doesn't matter where you start. There isn't really any structure in the knowledge you need to acquire. So it's not like, well, start at the beginning. Um, it's more like there are lots of concepts. They are loosely interrelated. Some of them overlap. Some of them depend on others, um, but in really kind of non-linear ways. So the point is really just to start somewhere and then look at what's around you and, and, and choose somewhere to go next. Um, so I'm like, when I think about, you know, my, because I'm not a particularly quantitative person, I definitely didn't start off being a maths lover. Um, and, uh, you know, as a geologist, I don't remember doing a lot of math stuff. Um, but, you know, I've really just, I think as most of us do, uh, like collected tools and techniques as I've gone along. And especially when you come across things like, you know, seismic data. Okay, well, now you need to think about sampling and you probably need to know what Fourier transforms are. And, um, and then you come across seismic inversion and you need to know about linear algebra and then you're looking at doing a well tie. So now you need to know about interpolation. And, um, you know, you, so you acquire these things on an as needed basis in a completely pragmatic, um, like literally just what do I need to know now? Let's learn that. I'll read a paper. I'll read the Wikipedia page. I'll read half a chapter in a book and then I'll try and apply it. And, and when it doesn't work, I'll figure out why. And then I'll move on to the next thing. So, um, I, so my, my sort of conclusion was, you know, try to learn things, like deliberately try to understand, oh, this is a graph, like what does that mean? What can I do with graphs? Um, rather than just kind of breezing past stuff and going, oh, okay, you know, I can use this library, I type this command, stuff happens, I move on. Like that's a very shallow way, I think, of um, engaging with technology. So I think with a little bit of depth, um, you can get a really long way really quickly. Um, okay, so I, I don't have much more to say about this picture <laughs> other than to say I made this weird map. Maybe it's useful, um, but it doesn't, it's not a map of, it's not a map you can use to go on a journey. It's more like a map you can use to say, what's that? I'll Google it. <laughs> and proximity indicates that they're sort of loosely related. Now I did try to map on here some um, Python tools just for a, um, to give a little bit of indication, but I don't know how useful that's gonna be. And if you're not into Python already, probably not very is the answer. Now, I think one of the key things to, to sort of this quantitative approach, one of the key sort of mindsets to get into as early as possible is to say, well, everything is data. And what do I mean by that? Well, I saw this tweet a couple of years ago, I think now, um, where Craig McGee, who's an awesome geologist, uh, works on a lot of uh, volcanic stuff, uh, seismic interpretation and so on, um, uh, tweeted this out about like interpreting these fractures and faults on some, um, on some 3D seismic volumes. And I was like, oh, yeah, that's really cool. But when I asked him about it, it turned out he'd done it in Illustrator. Um, you know, so this is a picture. And I'm like, oh, that's such a near miss. Like, if only it was in ArcGIS or, 
you know, somewhere where, okay, now there's, these are actual coordinates. And now I can go and do some analysis of like, how does the fracture density vary over here? I can make a different map. Um, and you can actually start to dig into things and ask questions about the data. If it's just a drawing, um, there's really not that much you can, you can do. And, and the tragedy is it would have been the same amount of effort to do it in, in ArcGIS. Here's another similar question about drafting stratigraphic columns. You know, I've got this student, they don't have easy access to Illustrator. I'm like, well, don't use Illustrator <laughs> or anything like Illustrator. Um, there's a tool for Python I wrote called Striplog, and I'm sure there are other tools like it too, um, that makes sure pretty, you know, base, I mean, obviously you can make much more complex ones than this, but it makes pretty basic stratigraphic columns. But the point is that once you've got stratigraphic columns that represent lithology, and perhaps another column which represents um, chronostratigraphy in some way. Well, now you can ask questions. Now you can do things like show me all the sands in the tertiary. And it's just a bit of maths that the software will do for you. If it's just a drawing, you, you can't dig into those questions. Um, you're gonna have to start measuring things and um, building a spreadsheet and so on. Uh, once this is data, you can ask questions in Python say almost instantaneously. So how do you plot a course through all this? And I, I'm, I, the, the, the next few slides here are really more for reference. So I'm not gonna dwell on these too much, um, but we can certainly chat about them in a minute and come back to them. But I wanted to give you some sort of pointers um, and links that you could go off and explore. And, and this isn't really about plotting a course. Like I said, I don't really plan. It's more about sort of accidentally finding your way through uh, the million things you could pay attention to. Well, when it comes to being more digital, being more quantitative, uh, coding and so on, uh, these are the things that I think a person should do. Um, a, 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 let's say a geo person. Um, and so I'm gonna go through them one at a time, just a reminder, these slides are up here at this link. Um, so the first thing is to go join Software Underground. It's a Slack. So, um, you know, it's a chat app. You've seen apps like this before. There are loads and loads of channels uh, on things like um, sedimentology, uh, geothermal, carbon capture and storage, uh, fractures, you know, all sorts of things. There are dozens and perhaps even hundreds of channels at this point. Um, some of them like machine learning and Python are very busy, uh, others less so. Um, but, you know, there are over 3000 people in this community and um, it's really active every day. It's entirely just people who like rocks and computers. So if you consider yourself to be that kind of person or you wanna be that kind of person, uh, I would say this Slack is a really good place to be. Very high signal to noise, I promise there's no chaff. Next thing is to find a personal project of some sort. You, you really can't, I'm just gonna say you can't learn a program without some purpose, like something that's burning inside you that you need to do, a plot you wanna make, a paper you wanna reproduce, something like that. So I've given some ideas here for what sorts of projects, um, uh, sorry, I guess the ideas are on the right, what sorts of projects might make good uh, personal projects. Uh, and then just some advice like, don't try to be, do everything perfectly. Um, don't choose something with deadlines. Choose something that's got really just one big idea in it. Um, you know, I'm sure you can come up with something in a domain that you're interested in. Like maybe it's like spec decomp for logs somehow, or like wavelet estimation for dummies or something that you think is cool that you'll stick with. Uh, and then basically just focus on it and stick with it. Like it, it really is the only way to learn. Going into a class or a course or something without a project is, um, you're just very unlikely, I think, to absorb that material. And there's some places over here on the right where you can, uh, if you can't think of a project of your own, uh, there's some ideas. This last one, the ago.co Cata Live, those are some problems that I wrote. Um, they're like little projects, basically. And the first one is actually a Markov chain on a sedimentary sequence. So, um, uh, and if you click on that link, you're going to be able to go straight into the notebook and you, if you already know a bit of Python, you can start on it right away. There's also this Zeek thing. Um, 
it's a bit like Kaggle. So these are data science contests, uh, but they're geoscience related. And there's a few problems on there from, the, from like last year. Uh, they've got a problem on there right now on uh, visualization, which is pretty fun. So you can go check out zeek.ai uh, and find problems there too. I've given you some examples here of projects I've worked on in the past. Uh, you know, this one, you can go grab the code at GitHub. Um, if, you, if you're getting into it and you want to build a little web app, by all means, take this one. It's rubbish. It's the first thing I built uh, back in, like, I think 10 years ago. Um, it still runs like it's still on the internet, uh, but I'm, you know, I'm sort of proud of it because I it was the first thing I did, but it's not a great piece of technology. So don't like, you know, don't read the code going, wow, you know, uh, it, it's not, it's, it's pretty wobbly, um, but by all means, um, use it as inspiration. Here's another app I built a bit more recently. There's some code that goes along with this as well. Um, if you go to the app, there's a link on the about page to the, to some code that you can reproduce this for yourself on your computer. And uh, here's another example. The link at the top there is a blog post that has a video about this problem. Uh, this was actually another graph theory problem, or it ended up being a graph theory problem, um, <clears throat> even though it started off as a visualization problem. Um, next advice is to learn a language really well. Like, you just will get so much further if you can code a bit. Um, well, not just a bit. Like, learn, like I say, acquiring a language, to the point of, I don't want to say total fluency because I mean, I'm far from being fluent in Python, um, but I feel like there was a point after learning for about two or three years, and I'm a pretty slow learner, um, but two or three years in where I sort of switched over and felt like, oh, I think I could actually try to do almost anything now. You know what I mean? Like there was a point at which I felt like I could take on a project and I would at least get somewhere. Um, but it, like I say, it did take me a couple of years at least to get to that point. Um, <laughs> I, I made this yesterday. I'm really not sure if it's useful or not. In my experience, flowcharts are rarely useful to anyone except the person who made them. Um, hopefully this is a, a rare exception. <laughs> you start here, well, why do you want to learn to code? And then you, 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 you choose one of these answers. And you know, I, I didn't want to come off as the guy who just tells everyone to learn Python, um, <laughs> but Python has a lot going for it. Uh, but there absolutely are other languages out there that you should maybe think about if you've got other things in mind. Um, so I'd love to know what you think of this flowchart. Um, and if you end up using it for anything, then do let me know, because I'd love to hear about it. Um, like I say, Python's got a lot going for it. It's it's fun. There's a lot of jobs there. It's basically the most popular language in the world right now. Um, and luckily for us, it's easy to learn. Um, also, luckily for us, there's tons of libraries for it, uh, including in Subsurface, actually. So there's loads of libraries for like reading segwi files, reading LAS files, making plots, doing uh, structural geological analysis, even making things like uh, rows diagrams and uh, stereo nets. And um, yeah, so there's tons there already. It's, it, I, I think you'd really have to, if you want to do geoscience of some sort, then you've, you've got to think pretty hard about it if you were gonna go away from Python at this point. Unless you're living in that world where you like need to code in C or C++ because you need everything to be super, super fast. Um, but that's not most of us, uh, in fact. I just need to be able to write code fast. I don't care if the code runs runs quickly or not. Find some friends. Coding is absolutely a social activity. Um, find a, a one or two friends and meet up regularly to talk about your coding. Find a mentor or a study group or, or join a hackathon. But you, you, you will get so much further if you're coding with other people. Um, it's just like playing an instrument or something like that or, or learning a human language. You know, it's it's really slow on your own and you really have no idea sort of how you're doing. Um, you know, is this useful? Uh, am I doing this perhaps not right or wrong, but am I doing this in, a be in the best way? Is there another way? Um, get with other people. 
you know, we, we've run hackathons for several years now in, uh, in Agile um, all over the world. And so I've seen this, you know, play out again and again, where people do amazing things in very short periods of time when they, when they gang up uh, with others. Uh, good news is there's a hackathon coming up really soon um, at Transform. Uh, so not this weekend, but the next weekend, 17th and 18th of April, you're absolutely welcome to come and join one of the teams there. People are going to be hacking on all sorts of stuff. Uh, follow the links to find out more. And then uh, Agile's doing one uh, in May on geothermal. So uh, if you're more interested in geothermal stuff, maybe that's the one for you. Uh, again, it's free to attend, so please come along. Both of those hackathons are free. There are many, many courses out there, um, tons to choose from. So I, I, you know, I take courses regularly. I love seeing how other people teach. I love hearing material from another point of view. I like the motivation to do exercises and actually get through something. Um, so I, I really enjoy them. Many of them are quite inexpensive and you may already get them paid for through work and things. Here are a few to get started with Python. A um, couple of these do cost money. Um, I think some of them are free. I've taken courses from Udacity and Coursera and been really happy with, uh, with all of them. Um, Agile, my company, we also teach some courses. We've got some uh, on the website right now. You can follow that link on the left. Uh, the link on the right is to the CSCG Doodle Train, which I don't think has been uh, announced yet for this year, at least the schedule I think was still last year's. Um, but that's coming along in the fall and uh, I'm gonna be teaching a class on geophysics with Python. Um, so maybe join that uh, if you don't, if these ones we're doing in, I think they're in May and June, if they don't work for you. And finally, I've got some book and uh, other recommendations, which you can take or leave. Um, you know, the books like this are really great because they're full of stuff to implement. So if you're having a hard time finding a personal project, like just pick up Chris Liner's Elements of 3D Seismology and there's tons of things in there. Like every single page basically has got a figure on it that you could spend a happy afternoon trying to recreate in Python. Um, so those are, those are a great bunch. And that's my list again. So, you know, that, that's, those are my action items. Uh, I, like if you're, if, if you're not there yet, I really encourage you to go for it. Like there's no time like the present, get started, I don't know, this afternoon, this weekend. Um, it's, I've, you know, I feel like, actually I would almost go so far as to say that the first Udacity class I did changed my life. <laughs> like it certainly changed my career. Um, it was on, um, it was an introduction to Python and suddenly I could take these things, like I've literally, in fact, I think I could almost reach down there on my shelf. I've got an odd copy of The Leading Edge with an article from 1999 that I was carrying around with me for a decade thinking, well, I really want to implement this. I don't know how. Um, and I probably tried in uh, Excel at some point because I used to do DFTs in Excel because of out of frustration because I didn't know how else to do it. Um, and then Python comes along and you've suddenly got this whole new tool toolkit. So for me, it was, um, it was what I'd been looking for. It, like I say, there's so many problems to work on. We need all the people working on them that we can find. So if, if, you, you, know, if you want to join that community and be part of this new wave, then I really encourage you to jump in. Um, you can always find me on Software Underground. I'm always happy to chat about stuff, courses, careers, advice. So are lots of other people on Software Underground. It's a very friendly community. Uh, you can also email me here, uh, agilescientific.com. Um, Sorry, that my talking, I'm I'm a bit of a chatterbox. That was a bit longer than I wanted to spend. But I'd love, you know, if anyone's got questions or things they want to discuss, um, I'd love to get into that. So um, I'm I'm all yours basically for as long as uh, as long as you want me to stick around. Oh, thank you, Matt. Um, I got I got value out of this and uh, enjoyed seeing some of the like in your uh, in your language programming workflow page. Um, Scratch is a program that I've introduced my kids to. They don't quite use it on their own yet, but one of the things they'd love to do is to uh, create their own sounds and integrate that into the different flows. And I think that's one of the nice things about that one is that it's it's a graphical implementation of sequence of events yeah. um, using those those flows. So that's right. And there's actually a version of Scratch. 
uh, sort of for grown-ups. Um, <laughs> grown-ups can't use Scratch. It's really cool. Um, but there's another thing called MIT App Inventor. And um, what's cool about App Inventor is you're still using the visual programming, so the blocks, uh, which are quite fun. Um, but you can build a mobile app for Android and push it to like the Google App Store, like right from the tool. So um, if, you, if you're curious about mobile apps um, and you, you like Lego, <laughs> because it's a bit like playing with Lego, um, Google App Inventor, sorry, MIT App Inventor is really fun to play with. You can build an app in an hour. Excellent. Hmm. And so it, it sounds like um, another, I don't think you explicitly said this, but more just through examples and, and your own experience, a, a good approach to even learning programming is to incorporate more complicated um, applications like just in Excel, right? Like in, in relationships and things like that and build uh, and then make charts and graphs based on that information. Yeah, say, say that again, like you, you're saying, um, like go past like, so, Excel? So, yeah, well, well, so yeah, so not go necessarily go past Excel, but if someone's learning to get into programming and they don't, they're not familiar with the language yet, if you are familiar with Excel, that's a really good place to start to understanding the structure of language and getting more into, especially like the conditional formulas, right? And then how to, if you have it a large array of data using, the different functions within there on how to splice and dice and visualize different elements of that data. Yeah, no, I mean, Excel is an amazing tool. Um, it's, you know, it's a really good place to start learning programming. And so I'd say that, you know, you sort of feel that point right in Excel where you bump up against, oh, I need an if statement within my if statement. And suddenly things are getting really difficult to keep on top of um i'm concatenating this thing with an if and two ands and that, that that's the point at which it's like yeah you should probably think about learning to code mm -hmm. <laughs> like this is becoming unwieldy and then of course excel uh, files do have i mean there's all sorts of issues with dates that are what you know well-known struggles with date formats um and then there's weird stuff like people essentially you send your Excel to someone else and then they change it. And now it's like, which version are you using? And so keeping on top of versions of files and things can be a bit of a headache. And some of that stuff gets a bit easier with, uh, with code, not all of it. Um, or even a, a good way to do it is if you can do something simple in Excel, uh, take a look at how to do the, the same thing in parallel in Python or whatever language you choose. Cause then you already know what you want to do. It's just figure out how to do it. Yeah, absolutely. Excel is a great place to go find a good personal project. It's like, you know, I think everyone's got at least one kind of big giant spreadsheet or the spreadsheet that they have to paste data from daily emails into to go and make a plot for a weekly meeting or whatever. Like that's the kind of stuff that I think is, is good to think about automating or um, reproducing in code. But like I say, not at a point where it's urgent or where it's like has to be done by next Friday because that's not a good, that's that's not conducive to learning a new tool. It's just going to be frustrating. And, and what's probably going to happen is you're going to buckle and go back to Excel and kind of go, oh, well, that failed. Um, you know, I think it's, it's important to choose something where it doesn't matter when it's done because it'll probably never be done, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. That's the nature of, of projects, I guess, or coding projects is that, you can always do more. So choose something that's only got upside. Yeah. Um, back to um, the, we're, we're still waiting for more questions to come in. Um, but I, I have a question back to your, um, what was it? Your, your strip log chart and graph that you made with the linking with the different um, sequences, sedimentary mm -hmm. sequences. Um, so not only did you have a direction of the arrows, a size of the arrows, but it also looked like each of the nodes was a different size as well. Was, was that, is, mm -hmm. is that true? Like, so I don't know if it was like based on like, um, frequency or presence or something like that. Yeah, that's right. The, the quantity of each, um, facies or lithology is the size of the node. Um, okay. and then the number of transitions is the uh, thickness of each one of the edges or the, the 
arrows from node to node. Okay. Yeah. So one, so, and so the matrices you displayed, like the most common matrices I see is usually a correlation matrix. Is, okay. ha, have you used that to represent in a graphical format or has that been more, and if you have, has that been more or less useful than just using a, ta a correlation table? Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, one of the really nice things in, uh, in matplotlib, which is the main Python um, plotting tool, is there's a, you know, a really easy to remember one-liner for showing any 2D matrix. Um, or indeed, actually, a 3D um, array if it, if it can be interpreted as an image. Uh, so, in other words, if it's got three or four channels, so that's a really nice way of taking, especially you know, especially if you've got like a large correlation matrix because it's 100 by 100 or something. Or you, it's kind of like I, I guess you can do the same thing with conditional formatting in Excel cells. You know how you can kind of make a heat map, for example. It's, mm -hmm. it's that kind of idea. So, because it's so accessible. It's one of those things that you just do always, I, I would say, with 2D data, you know, nearly always plot it in some way. Um, yeah. It's just, a, yeah, just another kind of representation. And have you taken that in, in similar with the strip log where you've had like the cells and the arrows and like representing like directionality and, and preference? Like to, I don't know, I don't know if that mm. makes sense. Yeah, no, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I don't think I've tried like interpreting that as a graph. We did use something for um, there's a there's a kind of matrix that you get out of a machine learning classification task called a confusion matrix, mm -hmm. and um, what that shows is essentially what kind of errors you're making. So how often did you classify these sandstones as other lithologies, and uh, likewise how many times did you classify other lithologies as sandstone? So the kind yeah. of type one and type two errors. Yeah. And um, uh, I've w in the past played around with making those into what's called a Sankey diagram, which basically shows arrows of a certain width going from one side of a diagram to another, where one side is the true labels and the other side is the interpreted labels. And that's quite a nice way of showing um, uh, those those classification errors and the direction of them because it's quite a it's quite a big thing to pass. Otherwise, it's not a particularly intuitive table to look at. Um, yeah. So, but uh, having said that, I don't know that I've seen a really good display where I've gone, oh yeah, that's like that's completely intuitive. And, mm -hmm. and I think this is one of the reasons why that Zeek.ai organization, um, why they're doing this GeoViz challenge right now is to try and basically invite lots of people from other disciplines and from data visualization world and so on into earth science data and say, how would you visualize this thing? You know, so um, uh, like hopefully we'll see some really interesting plots and things coming out of that. But yeah. It's fun. It's fun playing with with plots. If plots are your thing, then you actually might want to try JavaScript rather than Python um, or R. R is a really um, uh, nice statistical language, but it's also got fantastic visualization tools in it. Um, and the cool thing about JavaScript is it's really easy to make. Well, not really easy. That's not true. Uh, it's much easier to make very interactive plots than it is in most other programming languages. They're sort of built for the web. So um, it, it almost expects a person to want to touch a plot. Okay, like turn on and off like a legend element or a filter or something like that? Yeah, or even hover on elements in the figure um, and you know have other data pop up or have them linked to other plots, those sorts of things. You, you certainly can do that in Python. Uh, it's usually achieved with JavaScript. Um, but a lot of the sort of really creative data scientists are spending most of their time in, in JavaScript. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. Well, given that we have a fairly speechless audience here, um, one thing I'll, I'll leave it to is, uh, I, I guess once you get your keyboard working, is that something, the, the results, something you'll send out? 
yeah, I will. How shall I do that? I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm gonna to have to reboot my computer, I think. But yeah, um, once I get that sorted out, I will, um, well, I can share it back with you and then you can send it out if you want. Okay. Yeah, it's just yeah, a bunch yeah. of plots, so yeah. Yeah, that's fine. Um, yeah, we'll do that. And um, meanwhile, thank you everyone for attending. And uh, there's, I believe this is, the link at the top is where this presentation is held. Is that right? Uh, at that's right. Yeah, exactly, so, yeah. If there's something you wanted to review or even reach out to Matt about, um, feel free to do so. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, it's uh, thank you, Matt, for your time and for uh, putting this uh, presentation together for us. Absolutely. You're welcome. It's fun. Okay. Thanks for the provocation. Yeah. <laughs> Always willing to poke. <laughs> okay. We will.